Hello and welcome to this week's lecture of SLUT 7829, Text Analysis and Corpus Linguistics. This week we're going to focus on text analysis. So just to give you an overview of what we're going to do today is we'll talk about what text analysis is, and then we'll have a look at different methods that are commonly used and are associated with text analytics, and we'll close off today's lecture um, with a summary and outlook. Right. Let's start with asking ourselves, what is text analysis? So text analysis refers to the process of examining, processing, and interpreting unstructured data. That means texts, right? And such texts can be, of course, emails, documents of any type, uh, social media content, product reviews, uh, to uncover patterns, classify, sort, and extract information or relationships, trends, sentiments, insights of any sort, uh, uh, sort or other actionable knowledge using computation. So in short, text analysis is any type of analysis on textual data using a computer, right? So that on the surface sounds very similar to what we do in corpus linguistics, but we'll actually go into differences between what uh, text analysis is and corpus linguistics uh, in a moment. But let's actually focus more on text analysis because there's a um, distinction that's often made between text analysis and text analytics, all right? So sometimes these two are distinguished. And when people distinguish between text analysis and text analytics, uh, then text an analysis refers to typically manual, close reading, qualitative, interpretative approaches, right? So basically it means analyzing text uh, from a traditional or using traditional means. Whereas text analytics is then distinguished from that in that text analytics refers to quantitative automated computational analyses of text using, for example, natural language processing tools or machine learning. Just to be uh, transparent here in this course, we do not make that difference, uh, differentiation. So we actually consider text analysis and text analytics to be synonymous. So we do not draw that distinction between text analysis as uh, being more qualitative and manual and text analytics more quantitative computational. So when I talk about text analysis, I basically mean text analytics. All right. So when we talk about text analysis, uh, it's important to also talk about related concepts. And two important related concepts that come to mind are the concepts of distant reading. Distant reading is an approach to text analysis that's pioneered by Franco Moretti uh, in the book that you see on the right. And it will, involves analyzing large corpora of literary texts using computational methods to identify broad patterns and trends. So what you can do, for example, is you can take many, many literary texts like books, right, uh, literary works, and then you can analyze them to see, for example, trends in when certain genres emerged, right, and when they fell out of fashion. So you can look at literary texts not by focusing on individual texts, but basically seeing broader patterns that only emerge when you step back, like when you look at the texts from a distance. Right? And that's why it's referred to as distant readings, basically looking at large amounts of literary text and then seeing if there are patterns, right? Um, so distant reading focuses on the quantitative analysis of texts rather than close reading uh, uh, of texts. So, and it's also associated mostly with um, the analysis of literary works. Corpus linguistics, so what we've been doing so far, is obviously a branch of linguistics that involves the study of uh, language using large collections of texts known as corpora, right? We all know that. And corpus linguistics aims to analyze linguistic phenomena by examining patterns and frequencies of words and structures within corpus. So the aim of corpus linguistics is really to focus on understanding language, language use, language acquisition and learning, language variation, so the aim is really to use corpora to understand language, right? Now, text analysis is broader because it basically is not limited by looking only at linguistic research questions, right? So that's the difference. 
So you can uh, you can see uh, distant reading and corpus linguistics as falling within text analysis, right? There are two special types of text analysis in a way. All right, so here, basically, I just wanted to draw that distinction. So why text analysis, distant reading, corpus linguistics, of course, uh, share the common goal of understanding textual data. They differ in their approaches, methodologies, and objectives. Um, in the methodologies, keyword analysis and uh, quicks are also used in um, text analysis. Um, but we also have methods that are just more common in text analysis, and they're rarely used in uh, corpus linguistics. Not never, but not as frequently, all right? And now uh, TA uh, is different from uh, corpus linguistics in that really corpus linguistics really focuses on linguistic questions exclusively. So the aim is to understand language, whereas TA is broader. Uh, it also encompasses um, looking at language data to understand language, right? But it's not limited to that. So as such, T uh, TA or text analysis can be considered a cover or umbrella term for any type of analysis of textual data. Now, let's actually talk about the methods that are commonly used in text analysis. And I want to do that because uh, we haven't talked about these methods before. So the methods we've covered so far are basically uh, concordancing, so creating quick displays, um, looking at association measures, um, regular expressions, uh, keyword analysis. So these types of methods that are very common in corpus linguistics. In addition, there are methods in text analysis that are just um, used to understand broader patterns that are not necessarily focusing on linguistic issues. They can be applied for that, but they are not necessarily used for that. So one of the common methods that is used in uh, text analysis is network analysis. And to the right, you see a network um, that shows the co-appearance of characters in Romeo and Juliet. So Romeo and Juliet is a play by William Shakespeare. And here you see how often characters co-occur in, um, in the same scene. So right? So how often are they on stage together? And based on the, based on the, um, the title, you'd guess that Romeo and Juliet would occur very frequently together. But if you actually look at the network graph, you see that that's not necessarily the case, right? So also you can um, basically use networks to visualize relationships between characters. So here it's the co-occurrence on stage, but also, for example, what family someone belongs to right? So the capillates here are red, uh, the Montagues are green, and others are blue, right? So this is also something you can add more annotation to these network representations. The size also matters, like the size overall shows you how frequently a character appears on stage. So again, that's also information that you can add. So that means that network analysis is a methodological approach uh, used to study the structure, behavior, and interactions within complex systems represented as networks. And complex systems can be, of course, language, it can be social interactions, right? It can also be genes or um, how uh, form uh, firms or companies or even nations um, interact in certain ways, right? Network analysis involves the analysis of nodes. So Romeo and Lady Capulet and Tybalt and Nurse and Juliet, they would be nodes, and these nodes represent entities, right? And then you have the connections between these nodes, and they are called edges. And we connect these uh, nodes um, via edges to get some information about that network, right? So here we try to uncover patterns, relationships, and properties of that network, in this case, in the play of Romeo and Juliet. Now, as I said, these nodes can represent um, any type of individual entities, right? And these entities can be people, organizations, speakers, locations, but pretty much any other unit of interest. So that's why network analysis are so interesting, because you can apply them to so many different real-world phenomena and systems. Now, each node in the network typically has attributes or properties associated with it, right? So in our case, it's the family and how often they appear. 
The edges or links represented uh, represent the connections between these nodes in the network. And edges can be directed or undirected. So in this case, uh, in our example here, Rome and Juliet, um, it's an undirected network. But for example, if you want to analyze who trades with whom or who spends um, or where people migrate, right, that would be directed because you could basically check how many people migrate from China to Australia or from Germany to Australia. Then you could also look at how many people are going back to China or to Germany, right? And that would show you basically how many people are going to Australia and how many uh, people are going away from Australia. So if you had a network like that, that would show basically in and out coming um, things, then basically that would be a directed network. When you look at interlocutors, so speakers in a conversation, then you could basically show using a directed um, network how many utterances were directed towards a certain person. Right, So it's not only how often uh, there were utterances between the people, but can show uh, for each speaker who did that speaker address. Right Now, the strength or weight of Natch may also be considered. That's what we do in our network, reflecting, for example, the intensity or frequency of interactions between nodes. Right, So in our case, it's how often people co-occur. Then in addition to that, you have network metrics. And there are various metrics that you can calculate, and they're used to quantify the structure and properties of a network, such as degree centrality. So if you have a network, for example, of, um, of a community, you can use these measures to identify who are more central members to the network and who are more peripheral members of that network. And so you can basically check uh, how many, no, how many uh, edges does a node have, right? And um, how strong are these edges, right? Um, you might, for example, if you have a very tight knit network, you will have many different edges for each node. And then you might have more peripheral people and they wouldn't have that many, that many connections to the individual nodes, right? So you can basically check for a network uh, or degree centrality. You can also uh, analyze different measures such as the between the centrality and clustering coefficients. So you not, not only have the visual representation, but you can also calculate statistical measures that tell you about um, what the network uh, shows. So these metrics provide insights into the importance, influence, or connectivity of nodes within a network. Now, when we look at applications of network analysis um, that are relevant for linguistics, right? So you have two types, which is social network analysis. It's again like an umbrella term. And then you have social linguistic network analysis. When you look at social network analysis that examines the social structures by analyzing relationships between individuals or groups within a network. And it's used to study, for example, communication patterns, who communicates with whom, the influence that people have over others, um, the information flow, like how is information flowing from through a, a social network and who is responsible for spreading information, right? But also social dynamics in various contexts, including organizations, like how is information disseminated within an organization, community, or on online platforms, right? So social network analysis is a very handy tool. It's a growing field in the social sciences, but it also affects um, linguistics in the form of social linguistic network analysis. Because in social linguistics, network analysis is used to study social relationships, uh, such as the type and density of speech communities. And that really helps to uncover the relationships between uh, speakers, so the network members, and identify key participants and understand the functioning of language uh, variation and change within speech communities. Like how does language variation and change or language use um, interact or how is it affected by network strength or the location of speakers within the network. I can give you an example. If you look at innovations and how they sp uh, spread through a speech community, you'll see that innovations are typically brought to a network from the outside, but not completely from the outside, but from people who are not who do not have too many connections to a network. Right, so innovations are brought in not from core members of the network, but typically from people who have looser ties to the network. And then once uh, the people who are well connected, so the, um, 
We have many edges within that network. Once they take on that innovation, then it spreads very quickly to the different members of the network, right? Okay. Now, another method that is uh, used and I've also used before is sentiment analysis. And on the right, you see um, basically the sentiments or the results of a sentiment analysis that I've applied to different literary works, namely a work by Mark Twain, um, um, a work by uh, George Orwell, one that I've applied to Lovecraft and one to Charles Darwin. And the idea was to basically check, okay, how many words um, relatively spoken, right? So normalized uh, frequencies there um, are associated with different types of core emotions. So how many, uh, what percentage of words in these literary works is associated with uh, anger, fear, disgust, or sadness, but also to surprise, anticipation, trust, and joy. Now, the more negative emotions are um, in reddish colors and the more positive emotions are associated with bluish colors. What this network, uh, what this analysis does not show is for example, negation. So if uh, someone says, I'm not happy, would just look at the happy. Of course, the idea is really just how many percentage of the overall um, lexical words, so not function words, um, is associated with one of these core eight core emotions. And you can see that for example, um, overall, you find that uh, Twain uses uh, more positive uh, emotions, right? Whereas when you look at Lovecraft, you find that there's way more negative emotions. And that's, for example, Lovecraft writes horror stories, right? And you also see that in Orwell, there's uh, overall, it's pretty balanced between positive and negative. Um, it's a dystopia. So it basically shows... Um, the life or part of a life of um, a character in dystopian society. And then Twain is more positive. You show, uh, you see uh, a lower percentage of negative terms and more positive terms. It's a more positive story, right? I think it's the adventures of Huckleberry Finn. And in uh, Darwin, for example, you see that there's an overwhelming uh, number of positive terms because he just describes things going on in nature, right? All right. Now, what is sentiment analysis? Sentiment is also known as opinion mining, and it's a computational technique used to analyze and extract sub, uh, subjective information from textual data. And by subjective information, I mean um, stances, sentiments, or emotions, right? So what sentiment analysis does, it, it involves identifying, quantifying, and categorizing the sentiment, stance, or emotionality expressed in textual data. And this textual data can be utterances, blog posts, reviews, literary texts, or news articles, right? So you can use it, for example, to check whether if you've uh, um, just published a product, right, on, on the market, and you get reviews, and you can check if the reviews are positive or negative, or what, associate, uh, what emotions uh, are brought up in the reviews, right? So um, if there's a lot of anger associated with responses or reviews of your product, then that's actually not a good sign. But if there's more um, terms associated with joy and trust, uh, then that's actually a good sign that your product performed well, right? Or when you look at um, news articles, you can check, for example, news articles about, let's say, a certain party or a certain person, and then you can check whether uh, the language used in these news articles are rather positive or negative, right? And that can tell you something about the stance that is taken towards um, that individual or the party, right? So these would be applications of sentiment analysis. Now, there are also important concepts that I need to highlight here when it comes to sentiment analysis, namely polarity, right? Now, sentiment polarity refers to the classification of elements of text into positive, negative, or neutral categories based on expressed sentiments. So in the example, we did not um, really differentiate between positive and negative. We do that with the colors, but most of the sentiment analysis don't give you um, an option for saying um, what emotion something is associated with, but they only say, okay, this is more positive, this is more negative, right? So again, think of the uh, product review, right? Uh, you just want to pr pretty much know whether the review is positive or negative, right? Um, 
So oftentimes these sentiment analysis only focus on sentiment polarity and not emotions, right? Now, positive sentiment indicates, of course, a favorable opinion or emotion, while negative sentiment indicates an unfavorable opinion or emotion. And neutral sentiment uh, signifies that there's no um, strong sentiment, right? Um, in linguistics, I can tell you that uh, looking at polarity can be important because the sentiment or polarity of adjectives impacts how they are intensified. Right, so that's also something um, where when you want to study adjectives and how they're amplified or intensified, then you need to basically check the um, sentiment associated with a certain uh, adjective. In addition, there are different sentiment analysis techniques, right? And these techniques can be divided into rule-based uh, based methods and machine learning-based uh, approaches. And the difference is that when you have a rule-based method, and then basically you um, you analyze the language using predefined rules or mostly dictionaries or lexicons, right? So when I perform um, sentiment analysis, I often use the word association, uh, word emotion association uh, uh, dictionary. That's really great because there are many, many different users, more than 2,000, we're asked to rate words and tell basically uh, whether a word, let's say great or good, is associated with one of these core emotions, right? And if you have great or good, then you'd basically say that it's more associated with uh, joy and uh, probably anticipation, right? Whereas if you have something like uh, rotten, then that would be uh, related, for example, with disgust and sadness. So you have these more than 2,000 raters, and they're rated many, many different terms, more than 10,000. And for each word, they basically said what core emotions they were associated with. And so that was a rule-based approach that I used there because it's based on the dictionary. Um, you also have these machine learning-based approaches. And what they do is you have lots of reviews, right? And then you can separate them into good reviews and bad reviews. And then you can train a machine learning algorithm and look for uh, words that appear more frequently in the um, positive reviews and words or patterns that appear more frequently in the negative reviews. And then when you have reviews where you don't know whether they're good or bad, you can then basically make a guess based on the language, whether it's a good or a bad review. So that would be a machine learning based approach to classifying sentiments. Um, in addition, you have things that are uh, called aspect based sentiment analysis. And if you have an aspect based sentiment analysis that goes beyond, beyond the overall sentiment polarity to analyze the sentiment towards specific aspects of features mentioned in text. So then uh, these approaches um, identify sentiments associated with, for example, particular entities, attributes, or topics within text, and they provide more detailed insights into opinionated uh, content. What you could do is basically to extract from a large collection of, uh, collection of texts um, whenever a certain person or entity is mentioned, and then look at the sentiment uh, in the quick of the preceding and post uh, uh, and following context. And then that would also give you um, a more detailed analysis of how that entity or person is viewed, right? So you don't do the analysis for the entire text, but basically look only at the sentiment towards specific aspects or entities in that text. All right. Another method that's very important that I'd like to talk about is topic modeling. So what you see on the right is how frequent uh, different topics are in speeches. In this case, speeches um, that are the um, address to the, to the union by US presidents. And for each of the uh, speeches, um, we analyzed uh, what they were about, right? So we had, to, for each speech, we separate them into paragraphs. And then for each paragraph, we determined, okay, what is this paragraph about? And again, of course, we used a statistical mo model that we're going to talk about in a moment. 
But here, I just want to um, show you that that way you can extract patterns, right? So for example, when you look at this and uh, you see that uh, in the last decades, right, um, there wasn't that much talk about war, right? But initially here in the mid, in, these, in this decade, for example, there were a lot, was a lot of talk about war. Right. And when it comes to, um, again, other types of war, right, not so the Mexican war, um, but here, um, any war, military stuff, you can also see that here that was more prominent of a topic. And here it was also becoming more prominent. Right. So, in contrast, uh, people, nation, uh, prosper and peace that was mentioned initially in the in the um, trust of union speeches and it has become less prominent or less frequent in more recent um, addresses um, by the US president. So what that just means is that for a text, right, you can identify what individual parts of the text were about in terms of topics, right? Um, and that works by imagine you have um, for each paragraph, what words appear in the paragraph. And then when you have many, 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 many paragraphs, you can basically see correlations between paragraphs. So some paragraphs are more similar to each other than to other paragraphs, right? And then you can group these paragraphs together and you can say, okay, this is a topic. So if they're highly correlated, the paragraphs, then you can say they form a topic. They talk about the same thing based on the words that appear in these paragraphs, right? And then you can extract the keywords uh, of that um, of these paragraphs, and then that would reflect the topic that these paragraphs are about. So topic modeling is a computational um, method used to discover latent thematic structures within a collection of texts. And it identifies or aims to identify recurring topics or themes that char characterize uh, the content of textual data. Right, so what is a text about? And what it assumes is that a text is not about one thing, but that different parts of a text are about different things, right? And you that means that when you have a text, you need to split it up into uh, meaningful units. And uh, if the unit is too short, uh, the topic modeling doesn't really work. And if the unit is too long, like the entire text, it also doesn't work very well. But if you do it by paragraph, typically uh, within each paragraph, we try to highlight one idea or one concept. So that's why when you deal as, at least with textual data, then paragraphs are actually good unit to analyze. And what are these topics? So the, these topics represent underlying themes or concepts that are prevalent in a corpus or text. And each topic consists out of a set of words that frequently co-occur within um, the documents in that corpus. All right. So as I explained, when you have paragraphs that are very similar, then that would mean that uh, they share collocations, right? Now, how does topic modeling work? It uses um, an algorithm that's called LDA, or latent decule uh, allocation, or LDA. And it's the most commonly used type of algorithm for topic modeling and assumes that each document in a corpus is a mixture of topics. And each word in document is attrib attributable um, to one of the document's topics, right? So basically, it tries to see which words are correlating in terms of where they appear. And when you have then these correlations of um, words, so the topics, then you can look at the topic distribution, which is what the figure in the top right shows, right? So there, the topic distribution refers to the proportion of each topic represented in a document. And that provides insights into the thematic composition of individual documents within corpus, right? Or different sections, subsections of a corpus. Right, so just talking about why and where text classification is useful. So topic modeling can be used for text classification, such as uh, genre classification, but also author th authorship attribution and uh, text categorization. 
So if you have, for example, many texts or essays, right, but you don't know what the uh, essays are about, then you can also use topic modeling to say, okay, these uh, essays are on topic A, these are on topic B, and some basically fall within another topic. And that can help you to then add information to, uh, for example, corpora, right? You can use that to basically say, okay, this subcorpus is about education and this topic is about um, uh, migration or something like that or crime, right? So you can use that to basically classify documents. Um, also, text mo uh, topic modeling can be used for discourse analysis. For example, it facilitates discourse analysis by uncovering recurrent themes and patterns in textual data. So that would help to identify topics of discussions or discourse markers, and also shifts in discourse focus within a corpus or text, right? So for example, if you have a text and you see that the beginning of the text, right, there the uh, topic is very clear. It's very strongly correlated with a certain topic. And then towards the end, that correlation goes down, then that would indicate that there's a shift in topic, right? So you can use basically topic modeling to also understand how a conversation has evolved and how it moves from one topic to the next. But topic modeling can also be used uh, in the context of language learning and teaching. Um, because uh, topic modeling can be used to analyze language learning materials, right? So it um, can be used to um, identify topics and uh, stance, uh, sorry, topics or themes in textbooks and learner generated texts and thereby ad, um, assist in identifying relevant topics or linguistic features for language instruction and curriculum development, right? So you can, for example, look at what different sections of a book focus on a certain topic. And you can use that to also check what topics are not explored in the textbooks, for example, right? Okay, the final uh, method that I wanted to talk about in this lecture was named entity recognition. Um, and when you look to the right, you don't see uh, named entities, but you see a dependency parser. And that is because named entity recognition is based on or requires part of speech tagging and, and uh, parsing uh, because you need to identify, for example, what are proper nouns, right? And in the uh, dependency parsed uh, text there, you see that, for example, John and Mary are uh, uh, tagged as proper nouns. And that would tell you that that means that they are actually entities, right? So that was just to give you an idea of how um, named entity recognition makes use of other information, and other methods that we've already uh, talked about in the context of corpus linguistics. Now, named entity recognition is a natural language processing or NLP task that involves identifying and categorizing named entities in a text into predefined categories, such as person names like John and Mary, organization names such as BBC or ABC or uh, the Australian Parliament, uh, locations such as Brisbane, uh, Perth, uh, Melbourne, Sydney, um, or dates, right, like 9-11 or Anzac Day, and many more. So basically, um, it makes sense to think about what entities are relevant that you want to extract, and then basically you can use different categories to extract certain entities from text. And named entity recognition actually plays a quite crucial, a crucial role in ex extracting structured information from unstructured text. Right. So, for example, uh, you have a text and then you want to know, OK, which people are mentioned here or what place names are mentioned here. And that would then typically be extracted in the form of tables, so structured information. But the table is generated from unstructured uh, data, so text. What are these named entities? Right. So these uh, named entity recognition algorithms typically involve part of speech tagging and parsing, as I mentioned before. And they aim to identify uh, or classify these named entities. That's what these algorithms are for, right? And as I said, these named entities can be many, many different things. People, organizations, locations, 
dates, times, quantities, or monetary values, right? So it really depends on uh, what your algorithm uh, is designed to extract. But that can be quite important, right? So for example, if you have um, parliamentary speeches and you want to know where do they talk about a certain person or a certain location, right? So where do they bring up Brisbane, for example? Then uh, named entity recognition is a very important part of that analysis. Now, just some uh, ideas for applications or some uh, examples of applications of named entity recognition. So in language documentation and description, um, there uh, NER, so named entity recognition, can assist uh, linguists in identifying and categorizing proper nouns and other named entities in linguistic texts. And that can aid in the process of language uh, documentation. So for example, this text is about a certain region or is from a certain region and also description by automatically identifying key entities mentioned in texts, right? So this is, for example, about Uluru or something else, right? So it can be used uh, in helping linguists in language documentation and description. It can also help in cross-linguistic studies because named entity recognition techniques can be applied to analyze texts in multiple languages and thereby facilitating cross-linguistic studies and comparative linguistic analyses, for example, by identifying similarities and differences in the naming conventions um, and entity references across languages, right? So what do you um, what do you call your brothers and sisters, right? Your nieces and nephews, your cousins. Um, how do you name things, right? How do you refer to things, terms of dress and all these things? So if you want to analyze that, then again, um, uh, NER can be used to basically assist an analysis that compares different languages and cultures. It's also a type of text an uh, annotation that's used in corpus linguistics. So named entity recognition tools are valuable for annotating linguistic corpora with named entity labels, enabling researchers to analyze the distribution and usage of named entities in different textual genres or contexts. So for example, uh, imagine you want to investigate all uh, texts about, I don't know, some some person like Donald Trump or something, right? Then you could basically um, look at a corpus and could check, okay, in which documents is Donald Trump mentioned? And then you could build a corpus about Donald Trump or whoever, right? So that's also something where NER can help you. All right. So that was uh, a short lecture today, but I hope that it's highlighted or explained what text analysis is right? How it relates to what we've done before. And also I wanted to explain some of the methods that are commonly used and we'll work on these methods in the tutorial, right? Um, but they're a little bit different because for many of the text analysis applications, there are no very good ready-made tools in contrast to corpus linguistics, right? So it will be a little bit more difficult to, um, to actually apply, apply these methods. However, the key points of today's lecture, so the uh, summary, is that text analysis is an umbrella term encompassing basically a variety of methods that aim at using computers to process and interpret unstructured data, so texts, and TA methods are used to extract and identify meaningful patterns in large amounts of texts. What's important here is that TA differs from corpus linguistics and that TA is not focused on linguistic issues or phenomena. It includes that because it's an umbrella term, right? But it's not limited to that. And corpus linguistics is very much focusing exclusively on using corpora to understand language. Now, the methods that we talked about um, in TA, uh, there we learned about these common computational methods associated with text analysis. And these methods can be used to uh, study relationships between elements. That was when we talked about network analysis. Uh, they can be used to study stances, sentiments, and uh, sorry, emotions expressed in texts. Uh, that was sentiment analysis. To uncover topics or themes that texts are about or that the text consists of, that was topic modeling or to identify persons, locations, and events in texts, and that would be named entity recognition. And the application of these methods is very diverse and ranges from linguistics over social sciences to business and, econo uh, and economics. 
So tax analysis is much, much broader and can be applied for various different um, means and aims and goals, right? Um, so it's not focusing so much on linguistics, right? That's what corpus linguistics does. Here, I've given you some additional references in, if you'd like to know more about text analysis and actually how to perform them. I focused here on text analysis with R and uh, there's also many resources in the Language Technology and Data Analysis Lab, LADAL, that I've pointed out before. So that's uh, ladal.edu.au if you want to explore more of text analysis. All right. Have a great week, everyone, and see you next week. All the very best, Martin.